Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him, love and praise Him. A little more today, a whole lot more tomorrow. Ain't God good? That little girl there, she's over there just a clap, and I tell you the truth, she. That's right. Okay. Hey, let's pray. Let our pastor get up here for a little while. Well, Lord, thank you again for allowing us to be here on Wednesday. Uh, thank you for the rain that you've given us today, Lord, and uh, thank you for all the many blessings, Lord, that you do bestow on us each and every day. So thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we got a lot of people I know that we're going to call out tonight. People that need prayer, and if you would, would you touch their bodies, heal them, Lord, lift them up, give them whatever they need, Lord, to just get through on this old world and. So we thank you for that. And then also tonight, too, please uh, bless our pastor. Give him everything that he needs right now, Lord, to stand here and tell us the great things that we need to hear. So thank you for that. We're going to tell you again we love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me turn my mic on. Okay. Well, well, isn't it beautiful outside? It is compared to hot and dry in the middle of December, so I thank the Lord that we had some rain. My goodness, life! It's uh, I would readily was ready for some rain. I'm sure most of you were too. We thank the Lord for it. How good God is! Uh, have you considered the amount of inches that we're behind if you count up the last five or six years? We're still very, very desperate in need of more water, or at least we think we are, and we're just going to have to depend on the Lord to take care of that. We're in the book of Exodus, back in chapter 29. We're still continuing to talk about the anointing of the priest, Aaron and his sons. We're in the tabernacle, and we've talked consistently about various aspects of the tabernacle. I did think to bring my uh, pen point tonight. Uh, remember, the we talked about the external part of the, the wall, and we actually moved from the wall toward the inside in our teaching, but in the Bible, you actually will notice that God starts here in defining all the parts of the tabernacle, which is where God resides, uh, if you will, where he meets the people of God. And there at the uh, mercy seat and works the way forward toward the gate, uh, uh, not the door of the tabernacle proper, but the gate of the, of the outside wall. And we've said this several times, but just want to do, say this again in order to help keep, keep it in perspective. The outside wall is 75 feet by 150 feet, and the tabernacle proper, which is when we talk about the tabernacle, is in everything included but we're talking about the tabernacle proper inside, which is only 45 by 15, a very small area. And if you consider the lineal foot in it, it would only be about 120 lineal feet um, all the way around it. Uh, the numbers are important. The number 15 is the number for rest. And so I think that all through the tabernacle, you're going to see that number reappear and show itself because God's people... If anyone ever needed rest, it's the people of God. Remember, they were on their way to the promised land, just like you and I are on our way to the promised land. And the promised land, by the way, is not typical of heaven. A lot of people make that mistake of trying to type Canaan as a type. How many of you remember that old song? We're on our way to Canaan. Uh, that's not heaven in the Bible. 
In fact, Canaan is a type of victory, not a type of heaven. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, which is where victory is for you and I. Uh, when the Lord brings us into victory, it, it really doesn't have a great deal to do with what's going on. You know, we've, we've just been so mistaught about this thing that victory is when everything's going all right. Not at all. Victory is whenever you have, you have the victory when everything's going wrong. And so we have it. We have it so backwards, you know. When, because we've been taught this humanistic idea of of, um, of Christianity, and so God's teaching these people now, and teaching you and I by the types and and the shadows that uh, we have victory only when we walk with God and do it God's way. How many have already seen that? God will not allow anything other. We can't approach God except His way. How many of you begin to see that already? That God doesn't decide to let us have a Burger King relationship. You do it our way. It doesn't happen. And one of the things that He's teaching us, and I thought about this early this morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I thought about the great lesson that God's attempted to teach mankind since the very beginning. In fact, it began with the first two siblings of Cain and Abel. Remember the story? Remember how that God had you know, Adam and Eve, and of course they produced Cain and Abel, and, and Cain decided, hmm, I'll just, I'll, I'll approach God my way. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do what I want to do. I'll do it my way. I'll bring the fruits of my labors, of my, of my garden, the things that I've grown. I'll bring that before God, and surely He'll accept it. And, um, of course, you know the story. He would not accept it. Cain did it his way. Abel did it God's way. And guess what it cost him? It cost him his life. But let me say something to you. If you're going to do it God's way, and there's so many people intent on doing it their way, you're going to be an odd person out. Because today it's all about the individual. We do it our way. And, of course, you know the story. Cain killed Abel. Abel was righteous. He brought the blood which God intended. And this is what this has taught, taught us is that the blood, without that you can't get to God. And it's the blood of the Paschal Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in, beginning in Exodus chapter 29, down to, let's begin in verse 32. We actually got down, I think, to verse 34, but we're going to start in verse 32 where the Bible says, And Aaron and his sons shall eat um, the flesh of the ram, and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, this is the time that God has using, is using to consecrate or to anoint the priest for the work of God. Let me stop just a moment and make sure that everybody has a handout. Is there anyone here that has not gotten a handout and would like to have one? Hopefully everyone has one. But if you don't, what about a picture of the priest, the high priest? Does anyone need a picture of the high priest who doesn't have it? And would be... We'll be glad to give you one. Uh, Max, how about taking this back there, Ann? The other Ann. <laughs> Anyone else need one? Give one to Frank and Ann. You need one? All right, here we go. Anyone else now? This is just a, a black and white picture of the priest's garment so that if you're doing your study, at least you'll have that for you. Well, the Bible continues and said, talking about Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat these things wherewith the atonement was made. Remember, the word atonement means literally cleansed or paid for or bought back. It's like the word redemption in the New Testament. To atone for something was to make the payment for. And so he's telling them that the son Aaron and his sons can only partake of that, which was used to atone because this this sacrifice that God's offering and has been offered to God, rather, not God's offering, but God has calls them to offer, is, is now a separated sacrifice. It's a holy sacrifice. And only Aaron and his children are able to, to eat it because this is the time of God setting them apart from all the other 22,000 total, somewhere 22,300 about, priest, but only the tribe of Levi and only the Aaron, Aaron and his immediate sons could be 
the priest and the high priest to begin with. And so the Bible says in that they are they wherewith the atonement was made, they shall eat those things. And the reason was to consecrate and to sanctify them. This is so important. I made this statement when we were here before, but I want to make it again. God's people are a different people. We are not like anyone else on earth. We are different. The price has been paid, and if we don't choose to live different from the world, what a terrible, terrible tragedy for the cause of Christ because the price has been paid for us to be different. The power that God gave us to live different is His Spirit in the New Testament. We are sanctified. We're set apart. And the word sanctified literally means that, to be set apart. Paul told us that we're to, we're to separate ourselves from the world, come out from the world, and be not entangled in it. So we're, we're, we're told again, taught here, that Aaron and his sons were to be a holy people. And, of course, the people of Israel. This is what this whole system was set up to do. And, by the way, this is why Jesus died, is to make us holy. Not just make us, just let us go to heaven. By the way, you can't get to heaven unless you're holy. Are you all out there? Holy means to be set apart. Holy means that the blood of Jesus Christ has made us the righteousness of God. And so we're being taught as we already early in the book of Exodus that God's people are to be a different people, a separated people. And he says he did this to consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger, someone who does not belong to God, not of the family of God, shall not eat thereof. Why? Because they're holy. They've been set apart. And so then we continue, the Bible says, and if aught of the flesh of the consecrations are of the bread remain until the morning, then shall they burn the remainder. I've always thought, you know, I wonder why that's so important for God to say, if there's any left outside of the part that's been used for the day that it's been used, then you destroy it. And he goes on to say, and he said, it shall not be eaten. Why? Because it's holy. Are you beginning to get the idea that God really, really places a st- extreme in- in- emphasis on holiness? And we've lost that in America, and especially in the American church. Well, not just in the American church, but especially here. You know, it just doesn't, doesn't seem to be any emphasis placed anymore. How many times have you? How many times have you heard it preached that we're to be holy? You don't hear it anymore. But God still expects it. And that means not only holy by birth into the family of God, and we naturally are holy that way, but to live as a holy people. Now, some people, I mean, remember that old term, holy rollers. Remember that? You know, people used to really frown. Well, I don't want to be a holy roller. But let me tell you what. I don't know about the rolling, but you better pray you're holy. Because if, you don't, if you're not holy, you're not going to heaven. And that means that you've been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that you're sinless in your lifestyle. But it does mean that your desire is not to sin against God. And sinning against God is not a small thing. The Bible makes that plain. And so the Bible says he continues and he said, Be sure that that's burnt because it's holy in verse 35. And thou shalt do unto Aaron and to his sons according to all the things that I have commanded thee. Seven days shall thou consecrate them. There's that number again, that divine number. And literally God saying, you're going to do it my way, and you're going to to allow this, this consecration to go on for seven days because that's the number of perfection, and that's the number of days I want these these Aaron and his sons to be set apart. And then in verse 36 is that thou shalt offer every day of these seven days a bullet for a sin offering. Remember, the sin offering was just exactly that. It was the offering that it takes in order for a sinner to be cleansed. And that's something that we make very little of today for whatever reason. You know, everybody that believes in Jesus has been cleansed. No, no, no. The devil believes in Jesus, and he's not cleansed. And so there's more to it than that. And that's that offering has to be applied. And we'll talk about that just in a little bit. And he says, and you shall offer it. Uh, as a sin offering for atonement. Again, that word. And thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. Wow. Even the altar 
had to be a holy thing. The altar had to be something set aside because the altar was where the sacrifice was going to be made. It had to be cleansed. And then the Bible says, seven days, again in verse 37, shalt thou make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Think about that. The things that God was setting apart and was making holy as he prepared the altar where the sacrifice would be altered, be offered. And the cleansing agent would begin. Even anyone who touched the altar would be made holy by the sacrifice that had been made there. How many love that? You ever heard that song? And I'm sure many of us love it. He touched me. Let me tell you something more important than that. You touched him. You see, there's a, there's a, there's an amazing thing about God. Um, this thing about salvation, it's not a business transaction. It's a love affair. It's not a one-way street. Never was intended to be. Well, you know, the Lord saved me. Well, you know, he did that for a reason. He did it uh, primarily to set you apart from sin because he loved you. But you know this? If he has set you apart from sin, then you should have a love relationship with him just like he has with you. And that's why he said, if you touch it, you're holy. Then the Bible says, continuing in verse 38, Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar... Two lambs. Now we're talked about the, the bullock being offered for sin offering. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually, every day. Two lambs. And then he says, then here's how you offer them. Verse 39, the one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer in the evening. Now, I, I thought about that earlier today when I was looking at this. You know, I thought, you know, Lord, you, you, it's one in the morning and one in the evening. Why don't you just... I don't know. I think different than other people. If you're going, we're going to get two. Just do it, you know, at one time. And I thought maybe God is teaching me that His people are so short. They they remember things such a short space of time. Maybe He's reminding us that the offerings that's being offered can't be forgotten that easy. So instead of order, offering both of them, and there'd be a, a, a long span of time, offer one in the morning, offer one in the afternoon. That may not be the purpose, but it spoke that to me. He wanted to remind his people that the offering was being made for them to cleanse them, cleanse their priests so they could do the work of God. And then the Bible said, and with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil. It, it, how many know that olive oil was all, almost always, when it mentions just oil without a definition of oil, olive oil was the oil that was used almost consistently. It, we'll find it later in the menorah, uh, the burning oil, the consecration oil. It'll see it mentioned here. And any, when it's mentioned here, of beaten oil. And one of the things that you need to see that, the oil beaten, uh, it, to me, speaks of of the pain that the that it takes to bring forth, if you will, the oil uh, that's going to be used for the consecration, and and the oil that's going to be used to uh, to to set the priest apart was not just a light thing. He said he used the phrase, I believe specifically, to remind the people of the price that the fruit paid, if you will, in order to be the consecrated oil. And so it says, and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. There's been a lot of discussion about wine in the in the Old and New Testament, and I uh, I won't spend any time here. But one of the things that you need to know, and many times um, when you when you see the word wine mentioned, it can be in fact fermented wine. In other places, it can be the uh, um, what's called the fruit of the vine. And when we get into into the New Testament, there are three Greek words that are used for wine, and, the, and when you see them in the and the text itself, it just uses the word wine unless you can distinguish the text and the context of the text. It would be difficult to tell the difference. But if you'll notice the context, you don't need to be a Greek scholar to understand it. And we'll, we'll explain that one day because there's a lot of people that think, well, you know, Jesus turned the water into wine. He sure did. Read the text of that sometime real carefully and you'll see what it was. I don't need to explain it to you, but I will sometime. 
And then in verse, he's going to say, And the wine for a drink offering, and in verse 41, And the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering. So they'll be offered in the exact same way, just at different times. And, uh, and there will be for a drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be uh, a continual burnt offering. Now hold on to this. Um, offering throughout your generations, and it'll happen at the door, if you will, of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you there, and I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified. How? By my glory. You see, it's an amazing thing. We think, well, you know, the sacrifices are being uh, being used primarily to sanctify, but only as God adds his glory to the sacrifice. You, you, taking a, a, a bull or, a, or a, the blood of an animal, that, that, that's not what does, that's not what actually is the sacrifice itself. It's the glory of God. Remember, God is teaching them that they're, they're following the strict rules of God for his glory. You know, I, I'm amazed that we don't get it for some reason. I'm sure many of you sitting here get it, but Christianity as a whole don't understand. We only have one purpose on planet Earth, folks. One purpose, and that's to glorify God. We're not here for any other reason. Doesn't that just blow your little peanut brain? Well, I thought I was supposed to do for His glory. Remember, and the Bible makes that plain, by the way. It's not my idea. It's in the Scriptures. So He said also, I, bye, 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 wherever I was. Yes, in verse hmm, 43. We finished and said this, and, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. Think about that. I will dwell among the children of Israel. When you go back to Exodus 25 and you see the whole purpose for the tabernacle being built, remember, God told Moses, I want you to build me a tent. And here's how I want it made, because I want to dwell among my people. Those things have just blown me. Do blown me. You, you realize how rebellious these people are? Well, I tell you, that'll give you an insight. Look at your own life. Aren't we all rebellious to some extent? I mean, just, rebe you know, we talk about rebellious kids and, well, yeah, we get that from us because we're rebellious against God. I was speaking with a father once about it. He had a, he had a child that was rebellious. And I said, well, are you teaching him how to be obedient? He said, well, uh, well, yeah, I'll tell him all the time. I said, you didn't hear me. I didn't say, are you telling him? Are you teaching him? You don't teach by words. You teach by actions. He said, well, how, how do I do that? My parents are dead. I said, are you obedient to your heavenly father? How many of you think that you, you, you should expect your children to be obedient, but you're not too help about being obedient to God? Boy, and that's sort of a... Anyway, I, I can see right now that's not a popular subject. I'll move right on. And uh, so he said in verse uh, 44, And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their what? Not their friend. I'll be their God. Do you understand that the word God can only mean one thing? And I'm always amazed at people to say, Well, I believe there's a higher power. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're right, but let me say something to you. There's a power that's above the higher power that anyone reckons with, and this is not just a power, this is a person. Got it? Power resides in a lot of things, but this is not some power, some energy. This is the person of God. Do you get the word person? He gives himself all the attributes of a person. He laughs, he weeps, he hates, he loves. I mean, I know that God hates. 
Uh, this is yes and this is no. You got it. He does. The Bible says there are how many things in the book of Proverbs that God hates? Six things that God hates. Uh, he said he's, you know how many know that God gets angry? He said he's angry with the sinner all day. So all these are attributes of a, not of energy, of a person. So he said, I will be their God. And they shall know, verse 46, that I am not just their God, I'm also their Lord. I am the Lord, their God, that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Why did I do that? That I may dwell with them. I am the Lord, their God. That says so much to me. I'm God. And the word Lord implies that I have, do you, do you know that there cannot be the term Lord unless we associate it, the word servant with it or slave? In order for a, someone to lord over something, they have to be something, or if they're going to lord over someone, they have to be people that serve them. So he says, I'm God and I'm your Lord. You're to serve me. You're to be my slaves. You're to be my servants. So, and I came, how many people would think that the king or the president would want to actually live among us? They're always in another place, in another, uh, they're usually abstract. That means they don't have any idea what's going on in the world. But I tell you what, God dwells with his people. Amen. His, his feet walks among his people. I love that old song that was years ago, God Walks the Dark Hills. You know why that's so important? That's where a lot of us spend our time. A lot of us spend our time walking the dark hills and the valleys of life. But one thing about our Lord, our Lord is not so high and lifted up that He doesn't walk with us wherever we walk. And that's what He's teaching us. He's teaching us, I'm here to dwell with you. But here's the thing, you got to do it my way or you can't walk with me. I will not compromise my holiness, and I will not allow you to live a life that won't. Here's the thing that I don't, I don't know that we, that we always get. I will not, I don't believe God will ever let people that are really His live a life that brings reproach on Him without there being a consequence. Wouldn't you agree? Well, whether you agree or not, the Bible does. So I want you to think about this thing is set up. We're, we're getting now, getting ready. And I know some of you say, well, I, w- I want to get back in here. Well, we're going there. Just wait a while. We're going to get back in here. We're going to, in fact, the next lesson we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be talking about the menorah, golden candelabra. We'll be talking about the uh, table of showbread. And we'll be talking about the altar of incense, uh, the next lesson we have. And we'll be talking about what they represent. What the priest does when they minister on a daily on a daily basis, it means that they stop here. And by the way, here's one thing you need to know: no matter how many ministers they are, priest, acting, helpers, pastors, teachers, whatever you want to call them, only one can carry you here. And that's Jesus Christ. No one else has the right to enter the Holy of Holies. We have to stop here. We can only carry you to a point, and he has to do the rest. That means salvation. Amen? Anybody have a question?